This, this is the strata. Layers of rocks that contain the geological history of a planet. Locked inside these layers are the atmosphere, soil, and biological materials of the past. Each layer represents a distinct period in time. On Earth, the KPG or KT boundary contains a much higher concentration of iridium than other layers. The existence of this boundary supports the idea of a major asteroid impact at that time. Bands within the Paleoproterozoic era suggest a major increase in the oxygen level of the atmosphere because of the appearance of large amounts of iron oxide layers. Each layer captures the rocks, minerals, and elements that existed at that location at that time. All of this would have been buried deep underground, hidden from us, if it wasn't for the geologically active nature of Earth. Forces on the surface of the Earth, like wind and rain, were able to carve a path in the ground exposing these rock formations. And the fact that we can easily access these locations means that we can learn a lot about what's beneath the surface of the Earth. Unfortunately, this is not the case when it comes to other rocky planets. Outside of Earth, Mars is the most explored planet. We currently have eight spacecraft orbiting Mars, and on the surface we have three rovers, one lander, and one flyer. But what we don't have is easy access to large exposed layers of rocks. Using current technology, landing a rover near these layers is extremely dangerous. Our landing ellipse is still measured in kilometers and not meters. However, since 2014, two spacecraft have been able to scan beneath the surface of Mars and give us some information about the subsurface structure from orbit. But not just rocks, water ice can also be detected from orbit. Now a new spacecraft has joined the quest for water and other resources beneath the surface of Mars. CNSA Tianwen-1 was launched in 2020 using its Mars Orbiter Subsurface Investigation Radar or Mercier sensor Tianwen-1 is able to look beneath the surface of Mars. This is how the Mercier sensor is able to sense this part of our universe. As humans, our primary means of natural communication is through sound. But since communication requires the transfer of energy from a source to a receiver, it's going to take some time. Lucky for us, the speed at which sound energy is transferred is so fast that it's effectively instantaneous for the distances that we use it. This is typically only a few meters. Sound travels at about 340 meters per second. If a person standing in the room 3.4 meters from the wall shouts something, that sound would take only 1 50th of a second to bounce back to the person, or just 20 milliseconds. There would be no perceptible delay. However, if we're in the valley and that same person shouts something at the valley wall 340 meters away, the sound would bounce back to the person in 2 seconds. This delay would definitely be perceived this delay would definitely and would disrupt be practical communication and would disrupt practical communication if that was the goal. There are times when we produce and listen for sounds not to communicate but to measure distances or perform ranging as it's sometimes called. Just as we can determine the time delay for an echo if we know the distance to the wall, we can determine the distance to the wall if we know the time delay. And this is one of the core concepts in remote sensing, the act of measuring physical characteristics of an object without being in physical contact with it. All scientific spacecraft depend on remote sensing in one form or another to carry out scientific objectives. This is primarily due to the fact that their target 
is usually hundreds to thousands of kilometers away, sometimes even millions of kilometers. Since the nature of space is that it's virtually absent of matter, spacecraft use primarily electromagnetic waves instead of sound waves as the energy carrier for arranging and remote sensing in general. Radio wave is a form of electromagnetic wave, and so it travels at about 300,000 kilometers per second in empty space. At such a speed, the timing of the wave is crucial to using it as a reliable ranging tool for measuring distances. Even a microsecond timing error will still cause the distance measured to be off by 300 meters. The use of radio waves in measuring distances is what a radar does. Radar is used to detect aircraft at great distances. They are also used as an altimeter to measure the height of an aircraft relative to the ground below it. Radar can be used to measure many other parameters than just distance. Radar stands for Radio Detection and Ranging. The radio detection aspect is much more sophisticated than simply detecting the presence or absence of a particular radio wave reflection. Radar works by sending out pulses of radio waves and listening for the echo as it reflects from the objects in the distance. Simple but accurate timing will give the distance to the object. However, we can get more than the distance of the object if we analyze the quality of the return signal. This is what enables us to use radar to detect the speed of objects, detect precipitation and certain clouds using weather radar, and now water and ice below the ground of other planets like Mars. It's a complicated process and has many limitations, but nonetheless, it's one of the most versatile tools we have when it comes to remote sensing. In fact, there's a subsystem called the Radio Science Subsystem that's carried by many spacecraft and rovers that's dedicated to analyzing radio waves. The difference between the radio science subsystem and a conventional radar is that the radar transmitter is on the spacecraft while the radar receiver is located at a ground station on Earth. The radar on the Tianwen-1 spacecraft is a conventional radar in the sense that both transmitter and receiver are located on the spacecraft. However, it's not conventional in the sense that it's a ground penetrating radar. We will now explore the basic principles behind a ground penetrating radar and then how they work in detail. We will then finally tie it all into how Tianwen 1 uses the Masir ground penetrating radar. In a ground penetrating radar, the radar pulse is directed towards the ground. When the pulse first hits the ground, some will be reflected and some will go into the ground. As the pulse travels through the ground, it will also be absorbed by it. Eventually, the energy of the pulse will diminish to zero. But until such time, materials in the ground that are along the path of the pulse may reflect some of the energy of the pulse back to the surface. These reflections happen on the surface of these buried materials, or, as it's often stated, these reflections happen at the interface between different materials. The same thing happens when we shine a light in a container filled with oil and water. Notice the reflection on the surface of the oil, at the interface between oil and water, and finally, the reflection at the bottom of the container. If we had a really accurate clock, we will detect that the reflection from the surface of the oil happens first, followed by the reflection from the oil water interface, and finally the reflection from the bottom, which really is a glass air interface. Since the same effect happens to our radar pulse, since radar and light are both electromagnetic waves, the intensity of these reflections from the interfaces, however, will be vastly different for radar and visible light. The delay in receiving the multiple reflections will tell us that there are multiple materials below the ground that we are scanning. It will also give us their distances. If we analyze the intensity of each reflection, we can estimate how much energy was absorbed in each layer. While not unique for every material, it will help us narrow down the type of material in each layer. 
Analyzing additional parameters such as Doppler shift, frequency response, and wave diffraction further narrows the possible material that's in each layer. They also help achieve better imaging resolution. Now that we understand the basic of how a ground penetrating radar works, let's now take a detailed look at the techniques used to get the various parameters from the target. All right, as always, this may get complicated. In a basic classic stationary radar, a pulse is sent out in a specific direction and a stopwatch is started. The radar then starts listening for an echo. If the pulse hits a big enough target along its path, some of its energy will be reflected back to the radar. As the reflections hit the radar, the stopwatch will stop and the time is noted. From this time, we can compute the distance to the target. The radar is now rotated slightly to a new direction and the whole process is repeated. After a short while, the radar has turned 360 degrees, scanning its entire surrounding. This type of radar operation can only detect the presence of a target or obstruction. As a result, the information can usually only be displayed on the plan position indicator, or PPI display. The radar is located at the center of the display, while the targets are located around the center based on their distances and angle to the radar. The main drawback to this kind of radar and radar operation is that it's a one-dimensional detector. It can only detect the presence or absence of the first object in the path of the radar pulse. This makes it useless for detecting objects and formations below the ground from space because the first object that the radar pulse will hit will be the ground. Another drawback is that this kind of radar doesn't provide a good enough resolution to generate a geometric shape of the target. What we need is an imaging radar, a radar that has enough resolution to generate a two-dimensional image of what it's looking at, an image similar to a map or a photograph. But how do we do that with a single radar antenna? Many times when we think of a radar system, we think of two things, a rotating antenna and a display that represents its surrounding as a series of dots placed around a center point. The dots represent objects against an empty background. It's important that the background is empty or transparent to the radar pulse, otherwise it will be impossible to differentiate between object and background. In addition, since the radar beam is much wider than the average size object we're trying to detect, Sweeping the beam across any potential object won't help to reveal the shape of the object. Because of these limitations, pointing our basic radar directly at the ground will reveal nothing, no shape, no object. However, if we make a simple change by pointing our radar sideways and at an angle towards the ground, then process the signal differently, things will start to get a little better. Not quite an image yet but a line with varying brightness along its length that represents the texture of the structures inside of our radar beam on the ground. It's a good start, but how does simply changing the angle of the radar beam relative to the ground give us this additional information? The key is how the radar pulse hits the ground and how it's processed. This kind of radar configuration that looks sideways instead of straight ahead of its motion is called a side-looking airborne radar, or SLAR. A side-looking airborne radar is pointed somewhat perpendicular to its motion. So, for example, if a spacecraft is orbiting a planet west to east, the side-looking radar will be pointed north or south, but also towards the ground. Since our radar is not pointing directly at the ground, but at an angle instead, all parts of the radar wavefront won't hit the ground at the same time. 
the part of the wave that hits the ground first would also be reflected first. This will be the part of the ground that's inside the beam and closest to the spacecraft. The part of the ground that's inside the beam but furthest from the spacecraft will be last to reflect the wave. This assumes a relatively flat ground. So what we get is something like a scan. The scan you would see in a non-digital photocopier where a bar of light moves across the document being copied. But in our side-looking radar, the beam doesn't move. Due to the propagation delay, only a small strip of ground will interact with the radar poles at a given time, thus given the scanning effect. When we describe the capability of an imaging system, resolution is one of the most important properties. We're familiar with resolutions such as 1020 by 768, 1920 by 1080, or 3840 by 2160. These resolutions are used in computer images and videos. They represent the number of individual elements in the horizontal and vertical axis of the image that's capable of showing a single color. Since we're using a single detector, the radar antenna, the meaning of resolution is different and is obtained through a totally different mechanism. First off, resolution is defined as the minimum distance two objects need to be apart so that they can still be detected as two separate objects instead of one by the radar system. This particular metric has no bearing on the final resolution of the image that's created from it. That aspect is determined by other aspects of the radar system. So how do we determine the resolution of the radar system? We do it partially by controlling the length of the radar pulse. A long pulse exists for a long time. This translates to a bigger distance on the ground in which the object will be exposed to the pulse simultaneously. Although the objects will reflect the pulse at different times based on their distances, their reflection will overlap, making it difficult to distinguish the individual reflections and thus the individual objects. The distance that the pulse occupies on the ground is called the range resolution and is perpendicular to the path of motion. Since the output image of the side-looking radar is two-dimensional, this range resolution is the first of two resolutions required to construct an image. A shorter radar pulse will increase the resolution because it will occupy less area on the ground, limiting overlapping radar returns from nearby objects. The downside to a shorter pulse means that less radar energy will hit the target, making the reflections faint and harder to detect. The radar designer must make the proper compromise between range resolution and radar sensitivity. So far, we have a one-dimensional image with its resolution controlled by the length of our radar pulse. We now have to combine a series of these one-dimensional images into a two-dimensional image that will represent an area on the ground. To do that, we turn to the width of the radar beam. The smaller the width of the beam, the better the resolution. This resolution is called the azimuth resolution. As the spacecraft moves, the beam will hit different areas on the ground. Essentially, we're computing the one-dimensional image repeatedly as the spacecraft moves and targets new strips of ground, then stitching them together, thereby creating a two-dimensional image. The width of the radar beam is controlled by the length of the radar antenna. The longer the antenna, the narrower the beam and the better the azimuth resolution. Unfortunately, the length required for an azimuth resolution of 1 meter at a height of 10 kilometers using a 3 centimeter radar wave is 300 meters. This is an impractical length for an antenna on a spacecraft. This issue is mostly resolved by processing the various return signals from overlapping adjacent strips to reduce the effective width of the radar beam. When a side-looking airborne radar does this, it's called a Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR for short. When objects on the ground are hit by radar pulses that are significantly wider than them, the radar system may not be able to detect these objects individually 
if they are in a line that's perpendicular to the direction of the radar's travel. Remember that the azimuth resolution is based on the width of the beam. So, the smaller the width, the better the image. We can decrease the distance that two objects can still be detected as separate to distances that are much smaller than the width of the beam. To do that, we analyze the radar return data and look for slight changes in frequency. This change in frequency is caused by the spacecraft's motion relative to the object on the ground. It's called a Doppler shift. This is the same effect that you hear when a train or ambulance with a siren on passes by you. Instead of a shift in the frequency of the radio waves, it's a shift in the frequency of the sound waves. As the sound source approaches you, its frequency will increase. As it moves away from you, its frequency will decrease. Now with our spaceborne radar, the source of the radio wave is the radar which is attached to the moving spacecraft. When the radar waves reflect from the ground, some of that reflection will be directed at our spacecraft. This means that the source of the reflection will be approaching our spacecraft at a certain speed, thus creating a frequency shift or Doppler shift relative to the original outgoing radar wave. This shift is proportional to the speed of approach or recession of the spacecraft relative to the ground object. This speed, however, is not the actual speed of the spacecraft. Instead, it's the radial speed of the spacecraft relative to the ground object. The radial speed is the component of the spacecraft's velocity that points in the direction of the ground object. So, if a spacecraft is heading towards the ground object, its radial speed will be at its highest. As it gets closer to the ground object, its radial speed will start to get lower. When the spacecraft is closest to the ground object, its radial speed will be zero. As it moves away from the ground object, its radial speed will once again increase. Since our radar beam is relatively wide on the ground, objects on the ground will create a Doppler shift in the radar reflection based on their angle relative to the direction of flight of the spacecraft. So for every major reflection from the ground, we also get the Doppler shift. This will then tell us where within the beam along a line that's parallel to the direction of the spacecraft movement a reflection is coming from. With the help of the motion of the spacecraft, these two techniques, measuring time delay within the reflection of a pulse, and also measuring the Doppler shift within a reflection of a pulse, will allow us to get spatial detail of the ground with a single antenna and heavy signal processing. So this is how a spacecraft can use a radar to create a two-dimensional image of the ground. The radar on Tianwen-1 is a ground-penetrating radar, so there's additional detail we still need to cover to make our explanation complete. Now that we can create a two-dimensional image using radar, we now need to talk about how we can tune the system to only detect reflections that originate from within the ground and not from the surface. The main control for this is the frequency of the radar pulse. The Earth acts like a giant low-pass filter when it comes to radio wave propagation. Because of this, the higher our frequency, the less it will penetrate the ground. However, the resolution will be better. By changing the frequency over time, we can control how deep our radar wave penetrates the ground. We can generate depth slices of what's below the ground. By adjusting how far our radar penetrates the ground, we can limit the amount of unwanted scattering that will be present in the return data. The main parameters of the return wave that are analyzed are time of flight, amplitude, and frequency shift. There are others also, but these are the main. All of these parameters can be modified in the natural environment by factors that are not part of the model that's used to create a reliable image of what's beneath the ground. A layer might appear further because the rate of propagation is slower in the medium above it. 
Another layer could fail to be detected at all because it's thinner than the wavelength that's used. This and a lot of other factors are taken into consideration and compensated for in a ground penetrating radar system. And this brings us back to the MASIR, the Mars Orbiting Subsurface Investigation Radar on board the Tianwen 1. With a better understanding of how a radar, side looking airborne radar, synthetic aperture radar, and a ground penetrating radar works, we will now tie it all together and see how the MASIR fits into the mission of Tianwen 1. The mission of the Tianwen-1 is to perform a global survey of the surface and subsurface of Mars. It also performs a more detailed local survey of the surface and subsurface using the Zhrong rover which was carried by the orbiter. In addition to the surface and subsurface survey, the mission of Tianwen-1 also includes studying the ionosphere and the magnetic field of Mars. But it's the surveying and the analysis of the subsurface of Mars that will help scientists map out additional information on subsurface glaciers that exist on Mars. These glaciers could be the source of water for a future Mars colony. As stated earlier, these glaciers below the surface have been detected using a ground penetrating radar attached to previous orbiters. In the case of Tianwen 1, it's Mosir. Because Mosir is a ground penetrating radar, its resolution will be lower than surface radars. This is primarily due to the radar frequency used and the distance to the ground. The altitude of Tianwen-1 above the surface of Mars varies from 265 kilometers to 12,000 kilometers. Mosir observations are made when the spacecraft is between 250 kilometers to 800 kilometers. At these distances, the azimuth resolution, that is the resolution along the flight path of the spacecraft, is several hundred meters, while the range resolution, that is the resolution perpendicular to the flight path, is several thousand meters. In other words, the resolution is low. But this is fine, because we're looking at glaciers that are tens of kilometers wide. The radar pulse is directed directly into the ground below the spacecraft instead of the side like other synthetic aperture radars. This is because of the low resolution nature of the ground penetrating radar with its lower frequency and the fact that the material composition below the surface is not uniform like it is in the air. The possibility of extracting additional spatial information from the reflection of the wavefront is based on the different times at which the angled wavefront hits the surface that's assumed to be relatively flat. Such an assumption cannot be made about reflection surfaces below the ground, so there's no need to angle the radar beam relative to the ground. In order to enhance the detail of the data collected, Tianwen 1 sends out radar pulses in two frequency bands. One is 10 to 15 megahertz or 15 to 20 megahertz, and the other is 30 to 50 megahertz. Using two frequency bands allow Messier to vary its vertical resolution between 30 to 7.5 meters at the cost of having a smaller penetrating depth. The penetrating depth in Martian soil is over 100 meters and in water ice it's over 1000 meters. A quick note on water ice. It may sound redundant but the reason for calling it water ice is because astronomers call many other things that look like frozen water ice. Things like frozen CO2 and frozen nitrogen on the planet are also called ice by astronomers. So they had to be more specific when referring to what we normally call ice. Okay, back to the spacecraft. The antenna and detection section of Mosir are designed to detect changes in polarization of the reflected wave. This is essentially a change in the orientation of the electric field in the reflected radar wave relative to the outgoing wave. 
These changes are created as the wave interacts with the soil, giving us yet more information about the soil that the wave has penetrated. The overall principle of the Messier ground penetrating radar is simple. However, getting information at a detail level that's beneficial to planetary scientists requires such a high accuracy in the data that advanced data processing is required to compensate for the inaccuracies of the hardware and basic physics models used. Prior to Tianwen-1, spacecraft such as Mars Express and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have probed the Martian subsurface. Tianwen-1, in conjunction with the Zhurong rover, will continue to add knowledge to this area of investigation on Mars. In addition to this subsurface investigation, Tianwen-1 will also study the geological structure, environment, and atmosphere of Mars with its other instruments. The goal of all spacecraft we've sent to Mars so far is to help us build a better model of Mars. The more detailed this model, the more effective future missions to Mars will be. At some point, this model will be reliable and detailed enough that we will be able to send a group of people to Mars to start a colony. A colony that has to almost be self-sufficient within a few years in the harshest environment that humans will attempt to settle. Success will rely on the questions we ask the heavens and the quality of data we collect today. I'm DexDFX for Sensing the Universe.